I think they have like uh, either like Arabic or Latin roots. Um, oh, that's a good question. Yeah, you see that? So Jabara means to reunite or restore, and Al Jabur. Yep, Al Jazeera. Calculus means small pebble, I guess. <laughs> like in your kidney. What kind of questions do you want in the final? I have to make one today. Um, yeah, if you guys could just give me a list of questions you want in the final, it'd be awesome. Seriously. Coming up with questions is hard. Like a good question. Huh? Like, your cor like this whole course. Could you answer that question? No. <laughs> uh, Direction and magnitude. Pop up. Pop up. Oh yeah, Leonard. Yeah, Leonard and and magnitude. Pop what? Magnitude. Pop what? <laughs> or he throws himself on the grenade. Pop, pop. He dies. <laughs> you guys been watching the sixth season? I haven't really been enjoying it that much. Like, uh, yeah. they haven't been doing any tropes or anything, which is what I like. What? Season 5 was really good. No? They had the G.I. Joe episode, and the, the puppet episode, the lava floor episode, uh, the Meow Meow Beans ones. No, I like the Pillow Fort ones. Huh? It's all Pillow Fort ones good, where they do like the war documentary. And then Pierce comes back with the super weapon. Yeah. Just dressed as a pillow man. Yeah, the paintball episode was the best one. I don't know, Lava Floor was really good too. I really enjoyed Lava Floor. Or the one where Pierce like died and like he gives away all of the, uh, like he has the will and he gives everyone semen. <laughs> That's how he ends up dying. <laughs> so by like filling all the semen bottles. Probably. <laughs> so I put the echoes on YouTube, so you can watch them at double speed if you want. 
If you download them, though, yeah, you could download them. But I downloaded them and uploaded them to YouTube, which I think is a better interface than the Echo interface. And you can play it at twice speed. On the Echo? I don't feel like teaching today. Just have, I just really don't feel like teaching today. I don't know why. Maybe we'll go have class outside. Yeah, I'll just drag out one of these uh, one of these blackboards. We can just go around looking at trees and shit with our clipboards. People do that at universities, right? Huh? Okay, I guess we should start. <laughs> um, you guys should be getting excited, right? We only have like two or three le lectures left until you're done this course. Oh, I know. No. Uh, just remember that on your teacher evaluations. Yeah, just write off. Um, I'm teaching another course in the second semester, but it's a third year course. Logic, logic and set theory. Are you taking that course? No. Oh. Yeah, you guys can take logic and set theory. It's not going to be that hard. Like, it's not going to require any previous knowledge. I'm going to start from scratch. Um, like, a logic gate is, is an implementation of logic. Also, I'm here for two years, so if, if any of you are ever interested in taking an honors course, yeah, I can do that. Okay, let's, let's do this. Attention. Yeah, you're all, all out of order. Okay, guys, remember what a matrix is? We looked at one before because we had to take cross products and stuff. Okay, so a matrix is just a box of entries. Um, the index into a matrix is, well, at least a two by two, uh, at least a two dimensional matrix is ij. So this, this is what you have to remember. The order of ij is row, column. And if you can remember that, we should be okay. This has always been a little bit confusing to me, but just remember row, column. Um, so the elements of a matrix are called its entries. And these are the columns. So this is column one, column two, column n. These are the rows, row one, two, row m. Um, so that any arbitrary entry in here is a i j, right? So this one says uh, I am the element in the first row and first column. Uh, we can also see this matrix as being composed of n uh, vectors that are columns, or m vectors that are rows. Right? So a matrix is basically a vector with vector entries, if you want to think of it that way. And we're going to denote the set of all matrices with, that are n by m, so n rows and m columns, uh, with entries from r. We're going to denote that r n by m. OK, what are the dimensions of the following matrices? So what's the dimension of this one? Nope. Row, column. Wait, did you say 3, 2? Did I screw that up? I told you I found this confusing. Okay, this better be 4, 1. No, sorry, 1, 4 is right. My god. OK, so the min this is 2 by 3 because there are 2 columns and 3 rows. But that's, that's backwards. There should be three by three by two. Yeah, get on it. <laughs> it's number of rows by number of columns. So the number of rows in this is three. So the number. Hmm? 
It's, a, it's equivalent. Well, well, there are two columns, right? But the two columns contain three elements, right? So there are one, two, three rows, and two columns. At least, at least that's how I think about it. So this should be three by two. So this one is what? Four columns by one. I'm losing my mind, I think, maybe. <laughs> These are all reversed? <laughs> so this is the only one that's wrong, yeah? There's one row, four columns. OK. Jesus, that really messed me up. OK, row, column. Let's remember that for the rest of the class. OK, to clear this up, this one is incorrect. These two are correct. This has one, two, three rows. So this should be a three. And has one, two columns. So it should be three by two. Right? Similarly for, for both of these. This has one, two, three, four columns and one row. Anyways, um, here's an example. Here's a matrix uh, with entries that are integers. And it's a two by two matrix. So here's a matrix. It has one, two, three, four entries. It's one, one entry is one, so column one, uh, row one, column one. It's one, two entry is row one, column two, so that's here. Two, one is row two, column one, that's three. And A, two, two is row two, column two, so that's four. So again, just remember, row, column. Uh, matrices with dimensions one by n or n by one, that's one column, uh, one row, n columns, or n columns, one row are called, respectively, row and column matrices. For such matrices, we don't need double subscripting, right? because there's only, there's only one um, dimension. Right? So if A is a row vector, then we just number it like this. And if B is a column vector, then we number it like this. This is one row and columns, and this is one column and rows. One, two. Rows are horizontal, columns are vertical. Like a column, like in a building. That's how I remember it. Yeah. And horizontal is like horizon. That's how I remember that one. I always had to bring a dime and a nickel to my exams because I always forgot which one was which. Yeah. All my invigilators only required 15 cents in order to be, <laughs> to be bribed. OK, so we say two matrices are equal if they have the same size and the same entries at the same positions. Right? That is, they're, they're exactly similar in every way. So that is, when A and B are uh, n by n matrices, the matrices are equal if and only if, uh, for all possible rows and for all possible columns, uh, AIJ, AIJ is equal to BIJ. Right? So here's an example. Consider the matrices A, B, and C. When are A, A and B are the same if x is 5, right? That's the only way these two matrices can be equal. Um, but for no other values. There is also no value of x for which A and C are equal because they're of different dimensions and can never be equal. Right? So even if this was 5 and this was 5 and these two submatrices are equal, we can never account for that last 0 column. OK, we can take two matrices and we can sum them together. It shouldn't be that surprising that every time we introduce a new type of operator, or, um, like a matrix or a complex number, that we're able to do arithmetic over it. Uh, matrix addition is very simple. You just do uh, element-wise addition. No, because a dot product takes two vectors and gives you a scalar. Sure, yeah. Um, so if you don't add them together, that would be a pointwise multiplication of a vector. I don't think we actually have that. Um, anyways, but C, it's, uh, it's A11 plus B11 goes in the first position. Uh, and in general, at the IFJ's position here is going to be AIJ plus BIJ. And the difference is the same. If we view the matrix as uh, a col if we view this matrix as a column vector of row vectors, right? So we have one column, but in this column are vectors, uh, are row row vectors. Then we can 
define the addition of two matrices like this. Right? If you have a, a, a column of n vectors and a column of n vectors, you just sum each of the vectors in each of the columns. Right? So you, you should see matrices as vectors of vectors. Because then uh, uh, we can keep doing this. We can have a vector, a vector, of vectors to always go up one more space. OK, so here, so here are three matrices, A, B, and C. Um, a plus B is just given, again, by the pointwise addition of these things. So 2 minus 4 is minus 2. Minus 1 plus 2 is 1. 4 plus 3 is 7, and so forth. The subtraction, we do the same way. 2 minus minus 4 is 6. Minus 1 minus 2 is minus 3. And 4 minus 3 is 1. Are any of these defined? Well, yeah, this one is. What about this one? Why not? Okay, this one? No, this one? No. So this is wrong. That, that should be A plus, A plus C, I'm guessing. Yeah, I was explaining to those in my tutorial that the reason there's so many mistakes in here is because you're the first class ever to like be exposed to them. So already next year, should be fine. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you. You should, because I've just been teaching you all like wrong the whole time. Should, get, should distribute a free mark every time I, you guys find a mistake. Huh? You all have like over 100%, right, by the end of the class. Huh? Yeah, you'd have 200. Um, okay, so actually there's a lot of textbooks which if you find a mistake in it, they'll send you a dollar. Like a lot of textbooks in the front cover will say, if you find a typo and, it's, and you send it to us and it's one we don't have, we will send you a dollar. I found so many typos in this one textbook that I had to plead with the professor to stop sending me dollar bills. And he just refuses to stop sending me dollar bills. So one day I'm going to use those dollar bills for something good. I haven't decided. Did you write my journal book and like you made everything you did money? No, I did write my own textbook. And I deliberately didn't put this offer in because it would bankrupt me. <laughs> Plus, we don't have paper dollar bills in Canada. You, don't, you guys don't have them here either. But in the U.S., they still have dollar bills. So you can mail this. Long time ago. Like, it was in my, I remember when I was 10, we got rid of the $2 bill as well. $1 bills and $2 bills, yeah. And the penny. Anyway, so um, we have another operator here called the scalar matrix product. All this one does is take some scalar, C and R, and scales the matrix by this. Right. So we can also view this as adding A together C times. Right. So here are the two forms. Uh, it's just simply every entry multiplied by C, or if we look at the matrix as a column of row vectors, uh, we know how to multiply a vector by a scalar. So it gives the same type of definition. <clears throat> OK, here are three matrices. What's 2A? Do it by rows. Super interesting. Minus B. There we go. Third of C. There you go. Right, so just keep in mind that we can take these matrices and we can scale them by scalars. OK, we can also take a matrix and deconstruct it. Right, so I can ask for the ith row of A, which uh, is defined like this. If we want the ith row of A, that's all entries with an i in the row uh, and 1 through m in the columns. And if we want the jth column of A, that's a j in the second position and 1 through n in the first position. Uh, we're also going to allow ourselves to take dot products of these column and row matrices, as if they're vectors, even though it's weird that one's flat and the other one's up and down. Um, but let's just say that row the ith row of A dot product, the, column, the jth row of A, is just equal to the dot product in the normal way. This should be Bs. This should be a B. Huh? Oh, no, what am I doing? No, those are right. Sorry, I don't know why I said, said that. Um, yeah, right, so it's just the dot product of those two things. OK, so if we let a be an n by m matrix, and B be an m by l matrix, 
uh, note that they have different dimensions. Right? The matrix product, A times B, is the n by L matrix given by this. Right? So notice we have n by M and m by L, and the product is going to be n by L. And it's defined like this. The ith jth position of the, of the matrix product is equal to the dot product of the ith row uh, and jth column. Right? So this will be a scalar. Uh, notice that in order for the dot product to be well defined, the number of entries of row IA must be the same as the number of entries in the column. Right? So when we take a dot product, the vectors have to be of the same size. So the number of entries in the rows of A have to be equal to the number of entries of the columns of B. That's why these two numbers in the middle here have to be the same. Right? This is the number of columns of A, and this is the number of rows of B. Yeah, I guess here, in order for me to do this, it would have had to be a square matrix to begin with. It would have had to be n by m. OK, so this is technically wrong. <laughs> so this should be an n, or, or this should be an m. But you're, you're correct. Yeah, you're correct. Um, OK, but that's a takeaway from here, right? When we do a matrix product, the dimensions have to match up in a certain way in order for this dot product to be well defined. You, you can see it like this. So when, I, when you're actually working out a matrix product, um, so we look at this and we see that it has two rows and three columns, and that this has three rows and three columns, four columns. So the resulting matrix should be so this is 2 by 3, 3 by 4. The re resulting matrix will be 2 by 4. Right? And the way that you could see this, or see what, where this element comes from, uh, is that I like just saying, I'm going to take the dot product of this row and this column, and where they intersect here is where I should put the number. Right, so this is 8 plus 18 is 26 plus 0, 26. So here's another example. Um, so the entry that goes here is going to be the dot product of this row and this row, right? Because that's where the intersection is. So that's 3 plus 3 is 6 plus 8 is 14. Is that wrong? 3 plus 5. 3 plus 5 plus 8, 13. OK. OK, so what is the matrix product of A and B when this? First notice that A is 2 by 3, and B is 3 by 4. So the product will be 2 by 4. Let's, um, how can we do this? Let's just do the first two rows and the first column. So what's the entry in A times B, 1, 1? So that, that should be this row or column. It's row, wasn't it? Row. Right, so this row times this column gives us 4 plus 0 plus 8. So the first entry should be 12. The entry underneath it would be the matrix of uh, the dot product of this and this, which is 8 plus 0 plus 0. OK, so in the first column, we should have those two numbers I just said, 12 and 8. Cool. Right? And here are the rest of the dot products. OK, so suppose I give you three matrices, and they have the following dimensions, 3 by 4, 4 by 7, and 7 by 3. What dimension is A times B times C? Who said 3 by 3? Very good, right? Because A by B is 3 by 7. 
and then a by b by c is 3 by 7 by 7 by 3, so it's 3 by 3 in the end. Are there any other ones that are defined? Well, you can choose the ordering. That's, that's the point, right? Like, uh, what other? B by what? C? Is 4 by 3. Yeah. Yeah, 4 by 4. So that's 7 by 3 by 3 by 4. So it's 7 by 4. And then 7 by 4 by 4 by 7 is 7 by 7. E C A B. Yeah, four by three. So there's a there's a bunch of other there's a bunch of them that are defined. This is one of them. So I guess you should write down that. I should write down the other one. Yeah. The other one was B C A. Is there any other ones? A. No, you can't do A C, because this doesn't match with this. The dimension in the middle has to be the same. That's how I remember it, right? So these four match, these seven matches. C and A match, but we already have that one. Anyway, okay, so here's some properties of the matrix arithmetic. We're gonna delve into this a lot more in depth next week. Uh, but for now, it suffices to say that this is obviously not commutative. Why is it obviously not commutative? Right, because in one direction it may be defined, and the other direction, it may not be defined. Can anyone give me an example of another non-commutative operator? On vectors, maybe. Uh, cross. cross products. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does anyone remember the first question of the midterm? Yeah. Yeah. I asked if the cross product was non-commutative. Yeah. So many of you answered it was, or that it wasn't. Just, that was a giveaway. I may make that the same first question on the exam. Cross product is not commutative. Or maybe I'll ask if the matrix product is not commutative. Um, it is distributive, like this. So A times B plus C is AB plus AC. A plus BC is AC plus BC. And it is associative in terms of scalar multiplication. So we could do things like this. I'll give you a much bigger list next week. Um, but these are enough for now. Okay, so that was just a little bit of a, of a primer. The real meat of today's lecture is the solving of linear equations. Now, a linear equation in n variables is given by uh, this, right? Uh, these a's are all real constants. These x's are all variables. And if I write something down like a1, x1 through a n, x n equals p, this is called a linear equation. A better way of thinking about this, or the way that I like thinking about it, is that any linear equation in n variables has to have a representation as a dot product. Right? So here is a vector of variables, and here's a vector of coefficients of those variables, and here's another constant b for which it's equal. So if I took the dot product here, you would end up getting this. Right? So a linear equation can only arise out of the dot product of some vector of variables and vector of coefficients. So with that in mind, which one of these are linear? Yes. Why? Yes. I'm going to make this an exam question, I think. Not this one in particular. But I'm going to ask you if something's linear and throw in one of these sneaky. No. <laughs> yeah. I made, I made the answer to one of the questions on the midterm seven. You have no idea how long it took me to backwards engineer a problem <laughs> to like get set. I promise it would either be seven or twenty-three. I kept my promise. I asked for a times b dot c, and the answer to that ended up being seven because I promised you in class. Good. Oh, with this one. Okay, you guys are brilliant today. Small head of coffee. 
Okay, so suppose I give you a linear equation. Last week we studied that the zeros of these linear equations describe planes or lines in space. Um, there's a way to denote the zeros of an equation. So if, if f is a linear equation given by this dot product, the solution set for that equation are all points from Rn, which is called the ambient space, such that the function zeroes at p. That is, the function has a root at p. The set is sometimes denoted by the zero set, Vf, and is given by p in Rn such that um, ap1 through an pn minus p is zero. This is just another way of evaluating f at p. And so it's, it's all points that take the function to zero is the solution set. Okay, so we have f is equal to x minus 2 in the ambient space R3. Then what is the solution set of f? No. 2, 0, 0. Right? So the lesson here is to be mindful of the ambient space that you're working in. Right? I'll, I'll, it has to be said like in what dimension you're working, working in. Okay, here's a more sophisticated one. If I say f is the linear equation for x minus 2y minus 1 in the ambient space R2, then the zeros of that line are given by this parameterization, right? The solutions are t, 2t minus a half, such that t is in R. We studied these types of lines last week. Uh, you can find these solutions, right? So we are obviously not going to get a single point out of here because it's, it's a line. We're going to have an infinite amount of solutions. Um, so in order to get a solution out of this, you set one of the variables, say, x to t, and then you solve for the remaining one. So if you let x equals t, then we get 4t is equal to 2y plus 1, then we get t is equal to half y minus a quarter, or half y minus, well, whatever, 2t minus a half. <laughs> so alternatively, the line is given by this. Right, this is the line of solutions up, up here. So this is the interplay between the zero set of an equation uh, and its parameterization. So here's an example of how to do this type of parameterization. If I give you f and it's this linear equation in three variables, um, if we let x1 be s and x2 be t, we can solve for x0 and get 5 plus 4s minus 7t. And thus, we have this parameterization, right? If x1 is t, if, sorry, if x1 is s and x2 is t, then the re remaining x0 is 5 plus 4s minus 7t, uh, and we get a line, right? So generally speaking, if you have a linear equation in n unknowns, uh, you can choose n minus one of these parameters to generate its line, right? The point is, is that we eliminated at least one of the input variables. Okay, so considering the zero set of lines is perhaps a little bit uninteresting because in each case, there will be an infinite amount of solutions. Um, what becomes more interesting is when you start adding more equations to, uh, to your system. So that is, if I gave you two lines, you know there is a potential for those two lines to have a single point of intersection, so that's a solution. Or two planes have the potential to give you a line of intersection. Um, we're going to study this in general, right? how to solve systems of equations that are all linear. These are called linear systems. This is in part what the entire field of linear algebra is about, the study of these linear systems. They're extremely important in application because um, mostly every single type of science that you can do, uh, you can come up with a very good linear approximation of the input system and do this instead. All right, so you've been studying in calculus how you can take a curve and give it a linear approximation. So you can take any sort of dynamical system which has some sort of complex uh, high-powered polynomials representing it and just say, okay, at this point here, we can take this whole system and like, approximated by its linear uh, components and then use this to solve it. But that, that's a little bit <laughs> advanced. Uh, but anyways, we could extend this notion of a zero set from single equations to systems of equations. 
Uh, and instead of it being the, uh, the points P for which zeroes out an individual equation, uh, these are going to be all points P which sends all of these F to zero at the same time. Right? So the zero set of N equations F1 through Fn are all P such that F1 at P is equal to F2 at P is equal to Fn at P and are all equal to zero. And that is the solution that contains all points which simultaneously zero all the linear system. So here's a linear system. It's two planes. Um, so we should expect that it has an infinite amount of solutions. Does it mean that it's really No, sometimes when we uh, write a system, we'll just use a left brace. It's not it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's check that 1, 2, minus 1 is indeed a solution to both of these equations. Um, so 4 times 1 is 4, minus 2 is 2, minus 3 is minus 1. Okay, so that checks. 3 plus 2 is 5, minus 9 is minus 4, so that checks. Right? So this is a point in its solution set. But how do we know it's the only one? Well, it's not. Right? There are an infinite amount of solutions on the line where two planes intersect. How do we find the rest of them? And how do we like come up with a systematic approach for finding these solutions? More on this later. OK, so here are two lines, x plus y minus 4 and 2x plus 2y, 2y minus 6. So I want to know what the zero set of those two equations are. Um, any guesses? Uh, well, for one, you'd have to give me at least two numbers. No, just, just 5? 5 and 7. Well, let's check. 5 plus 7 is 12, minus 4 is 8, which isn't 0. That sucks. OK, 2 and 2. So 2 plus 2 is 4, minus 4 is 0. So that's a solution here. But here we have 4 plus 4, which is 8 minus 6, which is 2. So it's not a solution here. Correct. It is impossible. So look at these two equations and consider that if I know that P is a solution to F, it's also a solution to the same F if I multiplied it by 2. Right? Because this is just 0 again. OK, so the first equation multiplied by 2 is 2x plus 2y is equal to 8. Right? The second one is 2x plus 2y is equal to 6. It's not a trick question. <laughs> because we only multiplied the first f by 2. Right? So I'm just multiplying the first f by 2 to show that they're similar in this way, and that you're never going to be able to find two numbers that sum to 8 and 6 simultaneously. It's just not possible. Right? Challenge. Challenge accepted. Right? I'll invent a new number complex. called very complex numbers. <laughs> There shouldn't be a 3 here. Uh, 2x plus 2y can never simultaneously be equal to 8 and 6. OK, so when we're dealing with linear systems, um, if a linear system has no zeros, like the one we saw, that is, it's the empty set, we call it an inconsistent system. Otherwise, the system is called consistent. OK. So here are some examples in the plane. We have two linear equations, and they have no solution. Right? This is exactly like the situation that we've had two lines, and one just had a higher y-intercept than the other. Here are two lines that intersect at a point. It's one solution. This is a consistent system. There are two lines that are lying on top of each other. There are an infinite solution, so this is also a consistent system. Two, two, two lines lying on top of one another? <laughs> Ask your parents. <laughs> Every system of linear equations has either no solutions, exactly one solution, or infinitely many solutions. And those are the only possibilities. Or you can't have two lines intersect each other at two points. Can anyone give me a sort of uh, argument as to why two lines can't intersect at only two points? Because they don't curve backwards, so. 
How many points does it take to describe a line? Two. So if two lines have the same two points, then then they are the same line because they are defined by those two points. Right? So if two lines share two points, then they must be the same line. And the same goes true if we keep climbing up the dimensions. Right? If you have three points in R3, that defines a plane. If two planes intersect at the same three points, then they must be the same planes right? because they're defined by the same thing. OK, so then what does it mean exactly to solve a linear system? Right? If we have an infinite amount of solutions, um, how is there a meaningful way or what is the most meaningful way to express those infinite solutions? Well, the goal of solving is to find, uh, so if we want to solve f, we want to find f prime such that the solutions are the same between f and f prime, and f prime is easy to solve. Right? By easy to solve, I mean something like this. Right? Suppose I was able to find an equivalent f Actually, the correct term is similar. If I find a similar f, and it looks like this, notice I can very easily get these solutions out of here. We, have, we know that x1 is equal to b1. Then I can take this and back substitute into here and isolate for x2. Then I can take those two solutions and back substitute to get x3, and so on. Right? So when a system of equations has this form, we can very easily extract the solutions from it. Right? So this is always going to be our goal, right? is to reshape f into a similar f prime, which has this type of uh, back substitution property. OK, here's a little bit of what I mean. In R3, uh, if we want to know the zero sets of this set of equations, so we have three equations and three un unknowns, so how many well, we have the potential to find exactly one solution. Right? Three lines can intersect at one point. So I know that that system is equivalent to this system. Uh, and furthermore, it's equivalent to this system, right? which we know has this solution. Right? So that's my point. We want to be able to start with things like this and manipulate it to get this, or even better, manipulate it to get something like this. So all of these systems are similar. Right? This is the symbol for similar. I'm going to show you how. Um, but generally speaking, we're allowed to add any of these two equations together and multiply any of those equations by anything. Yeah, you didn't do this course already? You should have covered this in grade school. Grade school? It's like grade one, two, three, four. What do you call it? Elementary school? Primary? I did primary school in Australia. I did grade one in Queensland. That explains the accent, right? Uh, OK, so here's an arbitrary linear system, right? Here's n lines, or sorry, here's m lines and n dimensions, right? So this could have potentially, this will have an infinite amount of solutions or no solutions, uh, but will only have a single point of solution if this m is also an n. OK, so notice that the system from the previous slide can be written as this matrix product. Right, so here are a bunch of lines, constants times vectors. Right, so here, if I take this row and I multiply by this column, you get an equation. And that's equal to b1. And that's exactly what we have written here. Right? So next week, we'll be looking at a lot of equations that look, look, look like this. When you see ax equals b, and to mean this, this means let us consider a system of linear equations. If f is a linear system defined on the previous line, the augmented matrix of f is given by this matrix. Right? So you take all the coefficients from your linear equations, uh, and into this matrix you also insert the b's, the things that the equations are equal to. Right? So this part here. OK, this is, this is very important. The order of these rows must correspond to the order of the variables. Right? So notice that all of these a's in this row are the coefficient for x1. Right? And the second row is the coefficient for x2. Right? So the ordering in here matters. It doesn't matter how you order the variables, you just have to be consistent. Right? 
Um, so make sure each column contains the coefficient for the same variable. So this is the x, x1, x2, and so on. Um, a lot of textbooks use this line to separate coefficients from the constants, but you don't have to. I, I kind of find this annoying for some odd reason, just having to draw on the line. We're smart enough to realize that this last column was reserved for those coefficients. Okay, so you asked the question of how we went from one linear system to another. What we need to do is find a set of operations that we can do on that linear system so that the zeros don't change. Right? If I could just modify it so that each modification, we're guaranteed that we haven't moved around a root, we should be good. Okay, so if I have a linear system F and I take one of the linear equations out of it, we can replace that linear equation with a multiple of that linear equation, right, because the zeros won't move, or we can replace that equation with the difference um, of another equation from the linear system with the exception of f itself, right? We can't say f minus f, because right? that just gives you zero equals zero. Okay, note that combining these two rules means that we can replace f with f minus bg, that we can replace f with a linear multiple of any other equation. Okay, so here's some notation, um, because these type of deductions get a little bit messy. Um, okay, so the first thing I said is that we're able to multiply equations by constants. So when it's in its augmented matrix form, we're going to denote that by matrix times c, right? So that means we're going to multiply this row times c, like that. Here's an example. Second row should be 6, 12, minus 9, 3. Good. Here is another notation which says take c times this row and add it to the jth row. Right? This arrow means that this is the one that's going to be changing. Right, so I'm adding C times this row, so C A I one, C I N C A I N and C B I to this row. Right? So here's an example. Oops, the pauses didn't work. Whatever. Okay, so here's a matrix. I want to take twice minus twice well, I want to take twice this row and subtract it from this row. Right, so two minus two is zero, four minus two is two minus 3 minus 4 is minus 7, and 1 minus 18 is minus 17. Right, so that's how we can, uh, well, for instance, that's how we can get a 0 into here, which will be quite important. The last notation is that we can swap two rows. That shouldn't make any difference, surely. Um, so there we go. That's how we swap two rows. In your homework, I want you to use these notations. It's for your, or you don't have to. If you want part marks for incorrect solutions, I would recommend that you use this notation. Because we need to be able to follow your reasoning. Because right? if you make an arithmetic error, which there's no excuse for, because in the end you should be able to check your solutions. So, Okay, here's an example. I want to switch the first row with the last row. We get this. Okay, so we can combine notations. Uh, so for instance, I can say, given this augmented matrix, if you add, uh, if you subtract twice the first row from the second, and then subtract three times the first row from the third, and then subtract minus three halves the second row with the last, and then multiply the last by minus two, you get an equation, you get an augmented matrix that looks like this. So there's the answer to your question. Right? That is exactly where the second linear system came from, from here. Right? So now that we have all zeros, we can easily extract solutions. Right? For instance, this says z is 3. Right? And this uh, y can be recovered using this z. Right? So this is our goal, is really to get it into this type of form. Sorry? Why would there be 2? This one? Yeah, 
Yeah, we're going to do both. Right, but uh, already this is sufficient to solve the system. No, as long as each row requires one more step, one more step from the one below it. Yeah. Right. So this this has two unknowns, but one of the unknowns has been discovered. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. we could have a, we could have a scenario where these are both zero, and then we'll have an infinite amount of solutions described by what's left. Okay, so these three axons on matrices are called the elementary row operations and are sufficient for systematically solving linear systems. Um, that is to say, we could take these elementary row operations on augmented matrices uh, and the subsequent systems that we're getting in the middle all have the same solutions. Okay? So let A be a matrix and C a scalar, then the following are elementary row operations. Swapping two rows of A multiplying a row of A by C and adding a row of A to another row of A. And just repeating um, those operations that leave the solution set of a linear system invariant. Do you want break or do you want to power through? Okay, so the leading coefficient or pivot of a matrix row is the leftmost non-zero element of that row. We say a zero row has zero pivot. What are the row pivots of, the, of this? What's the pivot here? The pivot is the leftmost entry. So one. Okay, this is special, right? Five, right? So the pivot here is 1, the pivot here is 0, and the pivot here is 5. Right, so it all, it's always the leftmost non-zero entry. And if there is no non-zero entry, then it's 0. Okay. A matrix that is n by m is in row echelon form, also called upper triangular form. If no row with a 0 pivot is above a row with a non-zero pivot, and each pivot is strictly to the right of the pivot above it. Equivalently, a matrix, there should be an M here. Uh, a matrix is in row echelon form when all entries in a column below a pivot are zeros. Okay, so this is sort of hard to understand, but it's easier just to look at a picture. This is in row echelon form, right? Because beneath every pivot, are zeros. That's really all it takes, right? Oh, and the pivot, uh, the position of the pivots are always decreasing as we move down, right? This row couldn't be on top. Well, for one, there would be a non-zero uh, element beneath one of the pivots, right? But anyways, you want a zero underneath all your pivots, and you want to organize the pivots so that they're descending. These x's are meant to emphasize that. It's irrelevant what are in these positions. They could all be zeros, and this would still be in row echelon form. And they could all be something, and this would still be in row echelon form. So what's special about row echelon form? We're just talking about this. You can get a solution, right? We can start back substituting from here. Here, we're at least guaranteed one, uh, which gives us this one. Uh, but then the last one is going to give us an infinite amount of solutions, right? In order to get a value for, let's say, this x, we'd need y, z, and s. And we only have s and z. Well, we have some more concrete examples. All right, so back substitution is what's special about row echelon form. OK, so here's the system. And even without augmenting it, we can solve it with back substitution. Right? I can recover y from uh, isolating for y and substituting in z. Hmm? Yeah, it's the same linear system over and over again. Um, didn't want to make mistakes, so I just used the same one. Anyway, so we have, if I want to isolate for y, we get 7z minus 17 over 2. If we evaluate that at z equals 3, then we get 2. So now we have z equals 3 and y equals 2. So that means x is 9 minus 6 minus 2. Yes. Right, so 
Even without doing any linear algebra, you can still solve these linear systems, provided that we're just back substituting. You'd be, uh, it'd be more problematic if it was, didn't have this shape. Um, in general, any matrix in row echelon form will have the property that you're able to do back substitution. Using the elementary row operations on any matrix A can be reduced to row echelon form. Uh, so I'm saying here, given any matrix A, you can get to this upper triangular form no matter what. Right? There will be a sequence of steps to take you there. So let's solve the linear system given by this by reducing the augmented matrix to row echelon form and then performing back substitution. How many solutions should we expect? Infinite. Infinite, right? Because there are one, two, three, four, five variables and three equations. Right. In order for, for there to be exactly one point, we'd need five. Right. So this is very important. Unless you have an equal amount of variables to equations, you're going to get either no or infinite solutions. That's not to say that if you have five equations, you will definitely get um, one solution. Because I showed you a, uh, a system where we had two equations and two unknowns with uh, no solutions at all. Um, so these are good testing questions to ask. So anyways, we're expecting an infinite amount of solutions from here, or none. Um, so let's reduce this to an augmented matrix. Let's agree that the variable ordering is going to be x, y, z, s, t. So the first column, or first row, I guess, is going to be 0, 0, minus 2, 0, 1. Then we're going to have 2, 4, minus 10, 6, 12, 28. And then 2, 4, minus 5, 6, minus 5, minus 1. Oh, that's exactly why I put that there. Right? So you see how I get the augmented matrix out of this linear system. That's the easy step. Right? 2, 4, minus 5, 6, minus 5, 1. You just write in those coefficients. OK, so let's do the elementary row operations in order to get this matrix into row echelon form. OK, so we already have two zeros here. So I'm just, I just want to move uh, this to the bottom. Right? So I'm going to swap these rows and then swap these rows. Why would you swap one? Yeah, I don't know. Huh? Um, I don't know why I switched both. I think at the time maybe I knew this would result in an easier. Uh, yeah. Which one? This one? Why is this seven? Yeah, it should be a seven. It should be a one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Change this to seven, because I think everything else relies on the fact that there's a seven there. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, so suffice it to say, there's not exactly one set of steps that takes you to row echelon form. There are an infinite amount of them. Wait. Uh, yeah, I guess because you can just swap a row and swap it back. Uh, but anyways, you're not gonna get the same answers. Like you'll get the same solution but you won't necessarily get the same row echelon form. Uh, and you certainly won't get there in the exact same way. Anyway, so I'm going to swap these two rows and then those two rows to get that. So do we all accept that this goes to here? <laughs> OK. OK, so the next step is now to try to get a 0 here. Right? How can I get a 0 here? Yeah, I want to add minus 1 times the first row. Or simply, I want to subtract the first row. right? So 2 minus 2 is 0. 4 minus 4 is 0. Minus 5 plus 10 is 5. 0. Minus 17. Uh, minus 29. Hooray. Right. OK, so look, we got super lucky. That's why I did that. I knew I would get two. Uh, never mind, because they would work in either direction. Um, OK, so I got zeros here now. So what should we do next? 
See you guys later. Have a good break. We're tr attempting to get row echelon form, right? So we got to get rid of non-zero pivots. Right. So we need to get rid of this. But then we get a two here again, right? I, we have to use this row, right? Because we, we need these zeros. OK, so there's two ways of doing this. Either we can use fractions, or we can use least common multiples. No, well, I hate fractions. <laughs> I'll do this, then we'll do fractions. Uh, now I want to do the other way. Anyway, here's the point. If we multiply these two by the least common multiple, um, I can get a 10 in both first positions. Right? And then if I simply add those two, I can get rid of this 10. Again, there's like so many different ways of trying to do this. So yeah. Shouldn't the last number be 60, not 70 there? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> that is embarrassing. Yeah, lots of stuff can go wrong when you, when you do this. There's a lot of arithmetic. But you probably should all know your 12 timetables. So that's 60, not 70. I'll have to fix that. OK, anyway, so now that I have a minus 10 here, I can simply sum these rows. This will get rid of this 10. Uh, yeah, and then this should be a 2, I guess. I'll, I'll fix it. Um, anyway, so here's our row echelon form. Right? We have all zeros. So this is why it's sort of also called upper triangular. We have like a triangle here where like everything below the triangle is, uh, is a 0. But this is already enough to get our solutions, right? Um, I'll fix this, but supposing that I had no errors. Um, we know that t is 12. Uh, so we can back substitute into z to get this. Uh, but then we're left with this equation, which we can do nothing with. Yeah, so the solution here is a plane. Yeah. Um, so I can get oh, that for z and this for the first equation, which we can write like this. Right? So I have 2x plus 4y plus 6x is equal to 234. So I can say the solution set for f are all points x, y, 35, s, 12 such that 2x plus 4y plus 6x is equal to 234. Right. Or you can write this out as a line using the point uh, direction. Would you have to simplify that final direction? Huh? Would you need to divide this all by 2? Yeah, you could divide this all by 2. I left it in there just to keep it simple. Less arithmetic for me to screw up. OK, so if A is an n by m matrix, to convert A into row echelon form, you only have to repeat these steps. If two rows have a non-zero pivot in the same column, use one row to eliminate the pivot of the other by elementary row operations. Repeat one until no column has two non-zero pivots. And swap rows so that each pivot is strictly right of the one above it. Right, so this is an English description of what I just did. Um, this just requires a ton of practice. There's like no other way to, to really understand this. So I'll give you a bunch of practice sets for next tutorial. OK, so this is how you use one row to eliminate the pivot of another. Suppose we have two rows from A that both have a pivot in the ith position. Right? There are two ways that I can eliminate this AI. The first one was using least common multiples. So if I multiply A by BI and B by AI, what's this position after multiplying by BI? What's this position after multiplying by AI? What's the difference? Right. The other way of doing it is with fractions. So if I multiply A by 1 over AI, what's this? 
and their difference. Right, so when eliminating pivots, you can either go for this non-fraction method or fraction method. Uh, in practice, you tip, probably want to do a little bit of both, right? Because fractions are annoying to work with, but doing it with least common multiples mean that your pivots can start getting like enormous. Um, this is particularly important if you ever wanted to program this into a computer. In fact, the entire field of numerical analysis basically is how do we solve linear systems uh, with a computer? It's way more complicated than you may suspect. Um, I'll tell you why. So like, when you're working numerically, you have error, right? Like every number is a little bit off by its, so if you have root two, you can never describe that as a number with finite digits, right? So suppose we take that to like 100 digits and it has some tiny error epsilon. If I double that number, now that number has twice the amount of error in it, right? If I add that to another number, then you have to add the errors. So it's like you're doing an operation where each time you do anything, you have this error that's growing and growing and growing. Right, so the, the study of numerical analysis is how to get this error like, under control um, to solve linear systems. Big money in this if you ever want to study it. OK, so let's, let's use Gaussian elimination to solve this system. So the augmented system is 1, 1, 2, 9, 2, 4, minus 3, 1, 3, 6, minus 5, 0. OK, so we want to get zeros in the first column. Uh, so I'm going to take this row and subtract 3 times this row. So 3 minus 3 is 0, 6 minus 3 is 3, minus 5 minus 6 is minus 11, and 0 minus 27 is minus 27. Oh, right. 0, 3, minus 11, 27. What's next? Uh, this one. Perfect. So if I take the first row, multiply by minus 2 and add it, so it's 2 minus 2 is 0, 4 minus 2 is 2, minus 3 minus 2 is minus 5. What? Oh, minus 3 minus 4 is minus 7, and 1 minus 18 is minus 17. Yeah? What next? So that is you want to eliminate this 3? Yeah. So we're going to multiply this row by 2 and then subtract 3 times this row. All right? So it's 6 minus 6 is 0. Minus 22 plus 21 is minus 1. I'm not even going to try. What is this? 54 minus 51 minus 3. So close. OK, what next? We're done. Right? So this is called row echelon form. Um, but notice there are no fractions in here. It is nice. So it's called, this is called a Hermite normal form. When you have something in row echelon form and there's no fractions, it's called a Hermite normal form. This is my preference, actually. I like working with integers rather than fractions. Um, OK, so now what we do is we take this augmented system, we convert it back to a linear system, and then apply back substitution to get all of the values. Right? So we discover that there is a solution given by 3, 2, 1. <coughs> Uh, and what you should do every time you ever do one of these questions is confirm that your point is actually a solution to the linear system. There's no excuse to ever get one of these questions wrong. So you can so trivially check that you've done it correctly. So 1, 2, 3, it's 1 plus 2 is 3 plus 6 is 9, check. 2 plus 4, uh, 2 plus 8 is 10 minus 9 is 1. 3 plus 12 is 15 minus 15 is 0. So boom, for sure, it's a solution. If you're on an exam, you check it, you know 100% that you're, you're correct, and you, you don't have to return to it. OK, so let's, let's do the same deduction with a linear system, except let's use fractions instead of uh, least common multiples for pivoting. Uh, so why did I do that? 
Okay, so the first one is easy because we don't need fractions because there's a one here, right? Ones allow you to, if you could ever get a one pivot, use it because that's the easiest one to, to do least common multiples of cats. So th those two steps are the same. Okay, so now we want to use fractions. So I want to multiply this row by a half to get a one here and this row by a third to get a one there. All right? And then all that we require is to take this row and subtract this row. Okay. Which I was smart enough last night to work into here so I wouldn't have to do the arithmetic. Um, so it's 0 minus 11 thirds plus 7 halves minus 9 plus 17 halves, which ends up being this. Okay, so now I need to get rid of this pivot. Oh, no, that's it. Sorry. Um, well, okay, so I'm going to multiply this by negative 6, just so we can have this form, right? Okay, so we can use this to back substitute again, and we again get the solution 1, 2, 3 right, by doing the same thing. Um, because here it's e z is equal to 3, y is equal to this. Um, which one should be an x? This should be an x. Thank you. Here's a mark. Yeah. It's like whose line is it anyways? Points don't matter. Okay, but you mentioned earlier why, why stop here. Right? Why, why can't we also get rid of these? Um, and that's a good observation because uh, z the solution to z is easy to extract here. It's just 3. If this was just a 1, 0, 0 something, then we can just assign x equals to that something. It prevents us from having to do this back substitution step. Okay, so let, let's continue. Right? Let's use the row operations now to eliminate zeros above pivots as well as underneath pivots. Um, so if I take 7 halves this row and add it to this row, uh, you will get a zero here. Right? And then 21 halves minus 17 halves here. Right, so that simplifies to this. So now I need to get rid of this one and this two. So this one is eliminated by subtracting this row, because there's a zero there, nothing will happen to this two. And this two is eliminated by subtracting twice this row. Right? We get some, oh, so I, I do it in two steps. Uh, so we have zero, two, minus seven, or seven, uh, and then this, <laughs> right? So you can see, so this is called reduced row echelon form. And unlike echelon form, the reduced row echelon form is unique. It has to be. It has to express uniquely a uh, single point, right? These have to be one for it to be in reduced row echelon form. And otherwise, it's just echelon form. Um, so notice the qualities of this. We have ones as all the pivots, and the only non-zero numbers are the constants, besides from the one pivots. Right? So what do we get? We got z equals to 1, y equals to 2. Ah, z equals to 3, y equals to 2, and x equals to 1, which we know to be our solution. If it's not a 1, you have to do, like the final step will be back substitution. right? But it will not be in reduced row echelon form. Right? The, Yeah, so you, yeah, you can do that. I, in fact, I did do that a few slides ago, right here. Right. The point I'm trying to get across is if I say, is this in row echelon form, and there's like a four on the, on the, in the pivot, then you say no. Maybe I'll put that on the exam too. Oh, maybe I should put a favorite question number on, on the test. Does anyone remember my favorite number? 101. Mm, 101. <laughs> Maybe I'll give you 101 questions. Okay, so to give you definitions, a matrix is in Hermite normal form when it is when it is in row echelon form and none of its entries are rational. That is to say, fractional. And a matrix A is in reduced row echelon form. When A is in reduced row echelon form, ah, 
A matrix A is in reduced row echelon form when it is in row echelon form and each non-zero pivot is one and the only non-zero element of the column. This is a little bit hard to parse. So I have a picture here, right? The following is in, re is in reduced row echelon form. So first we check that all the pivots are one, check. Second, we check that all pivots have only zeros underneath them, check. And then we have to check that the pivots only have zeros above them, check. Right? And that the pivots descend in, or ascend in what column they're in. Right? So these two couldn't be inverted. Yeah, this doesn't matter that this is here. No. Right? Because we're going to have an infinite amount of solutions here, no matter what, because there are four variables and three equations. Right? So we'll, we'd never be able to get a row echelon form that assigns these to a number. Right? Okay, so this is the final thing for this class. There's an interesting application of uh, these linear systems, and which is sort of a misnomer because there's millions of applications of solving linear systems. It's one of the most applicable uh, types of mathematics. But nonetheless, there is an interesting application perhaps for this course, uh, in particular for the calculus side. Um, so I said two points defines a line in the plane. If I give you three points in the plane, that defines a parabola. Uh, yes, okay, it, the lines can't, those three points can't be coplanar. Okay, good point. So they give you three points and those three points don't lie on a line, then they must define a parabola. If I give you th four points, or if I give you, yeah, four points and those points don't lie on a parabola. Or a line. Or, or a line, <laughs> or, yeah. Um, okay, if you give me n points so that they don't, like are degenerate in some sense, that they're like lying in the same line, then there is a unique degree n polynomial that goes through them. Um, so that's you give me two points, I can give you a unique line. If you give me three points that are properly situated, then I can give you a parabola and so on. Now, did you know that, that three points defines a parabola? There's only one of them. That was always exactly one parabola that goes through three points. So, what is the parabola that passes through these three points? 1, 1, 2 minus 1, 3 minus 1. If I asked you this question on an exam or something, how would you approach it? Trial and error. Trial and error. <laughs> so we know the general form of the parabola is this, yeah? So there should be no x here. It's going to cover that. <laughs> None of them will be wiser. Oh. Um, so we know that this corrected is the general equation for the line of, uh, for the parabola. Um, so I could substitute these points into here to get three equations, right? So if I put one in for x, we get a plus b plus c is one. I put in 2 for x and minus 1 for y, here's minus 1 for y, we get 4a plus 2b plus c is negative 1, and the same for 3 negative 1, we get 9a plus 3b plus c is equal to minus 1. So we have three equations for three unknowns. That is the constants for this parabola. And if we solve this equation, we can recover a, b, and c and get the parabola back. Let's solve this using Gaussian elimination. Here's the augmented matrix. Uh, there's a one here, so we get these two pivots for free. Right. So now I've got to get rid of this minus six. So I'm going to multiply this by minus three and add. Now I want to get rid of, no, I don't get rid of the one. I want to get rid of this and this. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to go for the fully reduced form, right? So we got rid of all the numbers underneath pivots. Now I have to get rid of all the numbers above pivots, right? So it's minus it's three for this and minus one for that, right? And now I have to get rid of this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
And finally, I'm going to get rid of this one by multiplying this by a half. Right. So here's our reduced row echelon form solution for that, for those three equations. Uh, so I can read off the solutions. A is 1, B is minus 5, C is 5. Oh. <laughs> This is like, yeah, this is a sweet parabola. Um, well, I drew a parabola, and those lines, the parabola goes through those points. <laughs> suffice, suffice, suffice it to say. Um, yeah, but then I, okay, we'll try wolframming it. But then I, I don't know if I can plot the points on, well, at least we can. find our points. Okay, 1, 1, 2, negative 1, and 3, negative 1. Oh, you just got rid of it. Uh, 1, 1? Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, so 1, 1 is on here. Three. 3 minus 1? Close enough. OK, and then 2 two minus 1? Yeah, OK, looks about right. Um, so there you go. That's, this is called curve fitting in general, or, in, or interpolation. And it is also a super important problem. Uh, in statistics, for example, if you collect a bunch of experimental results and want to know the curve that fits those results, right, you'd want to use this type of approach. Except maybe you want a polynomial of like degree of thousands. Right? You're going to get something really funny. And if, uh, so yeah, I might teach an honors course in doing computer algebra in my tenure here. Next week, we're going to continue with matrices as operators, and discuss linear operators and then inversion. Because we didn't have a lecture. Yeah. And plus, I gave a shitload last week. Right? Yeah. There'll be ones this week. Yeah. Uh, I looked a bit, but if I can't find it, I'll just give you a grade. And I guess I have to give you perfect because it's my fault, I suppose. You get one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thanks, man. Last year, I was actually doing a bit of tutoring at the uni, and I was working for Matt Scarrett. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good guy. He was using Mathematica to do matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. So he found out that I, like, we were doing a making a program which would actually do the Gaussian, make it full, full reduced form. In Mathematica, just you put the matrix in and just do it on there and they give you. Yeah, so that's a pretty that, typical. That, that took like a month. <laughs> really? Oh, because we only had like one session per week. Oh, uh, oh, so it was like an assignment that he was like, because this yeah, is a very typical like, type of. Uh, right. Yeah, so like every programming student is sort of given this as. Uh, so was it numerical or symbolic that you're doing? I think it was. Like you could put any matrix in there. Like, like could I put A? Or like unknown values? Mm, might not have been. Anyway, that's pretty cool. Also, also made us fractals in Mathematica. So I'd love to give a course like that in, because uh, I work for Maple. So it'd be pretty cool if I could give like a course in yeah. writing mathematical yeah. software. I, I, I learned more from Mathematica instead of Maple, but it's like a pretty similar so. Uh, well, yeah, I'm just Canadian, right? So I'm obligated to use Maple. It's a Canadian company. Uh, but mathematic is also good. Python would also be a, a good language to code in. <sighs> Don't talk about Sage in my presence. They're like the bane of our existence. Um, it's not because they're free. Like I don't mind that. It's because.
there's just like they're really far behind. So like any time they like advertise a like new feature, like the rest of the computer algebra community is like, oh my god, we thought we did that like a decade ago. Um, like they're just giving the impression that we're like way farther behind than than we actually are. So they'll, they'll come give us presentation showing us all these like new features. But, like, we, we did that like nine versions ago. Like show us something, yeah. something else. Right? But obviously I'm super biased. Yeah, yeah, but to us, I use the free stuff, but we do all get Yeah, that, that's what they have going for them is that it's that it's free. Um, I may start programming in Python. We'll see. Were any of you looking for me? Um, my assignment ended up in your two group thing. Okay. So What's your name? Matthew. And it's meant to be a What? How do you spell your last name? Uh, a D. Did you receive a mark for it? No, well, it's in your file. I, I don't know. I oh, because like if it was in my file, I mean, like I probably just marked it. So check that you have a mark, and if you don't, then email me or something, because then we'll have to track down your assignment. Yeah. Okay, I got lost here with the describing a line as intersection two planes. Why are those two planes? Like, I understand they are, but like, I don't see. Can you write that as like standard form for a plane? I just can't see how those two equations below your proposition of planes. So if you have x minus x naught over a, and y minus y naught over b, this means that you have b x minus x naught minus a y minus y naught is equal to zero. And this is a hyperplane going through, what dimension are we in? Three. So we have a normal b minus a zero okay. at through point uh, uh, x naught y naught zero. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. X naught, Y naught. That could be any Z naught, couldn't it? Because we've got a normal zero. Does it have to be zero? Z naught? Yeah, I guess this could be any, any point. Yeah, could just be. Yeah. But the point is that it's the intersection of those two things. Yeah. Right? That we have this one plane that you can move anywhere. We also have this other plane that we can move anywhere. And those, the two intersection of these two things oh, yeah, yeah. will yeah. will give you something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. In general, what is it? It's x minus p dot the normal equals v. Th this is a oh no no zero. Yeah, this this is always a plane with yeah. that yeah, normal. Yeah, I, I should have lost it. The, that component, the z component of the normal is zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. No worries. I'm talking about the course that you're you're running next. Yeah, I don't actually know the name of it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I'm going to teach a course in logic and set theory. Okay. You know, the stuff we did like in the very, maybe second lecture when I showed yeah. you like those upside down E's and E's. So is that something that like, a first year student would actually be able to get through? Or? There's like no presumed knowledge. Oh, okay. um, like everything that you'll need I'll be giving in that course. But it may require some type of just sort of intellectual maturity. Because right. proofs are hard. Um, so. Yeah, like no background knowledge, but you gotta be, you gotta be keen. It'll be harder than this course, I bet, because it's a third year course. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I took it, and well, when I was younger, and I liked it. So it all depends if you like it. Do you do any computer programming at all? Uh, no, I'm just math science. Uh, you'll become I, good at computer programming if you take I this course. I didn't know how to do that. Yes, so. Okay. Um, yeah, like check out check out the syllabus, but yeah, logic and set theory is okay, it's really good. really interesting. You'll become very good at like thinking systematically and like writing things down. That might be like helpful for other. Yeah, yeah, it will be the course that will obligate you to think very concretely and write things down like, very concretely. Um, yeah, so take it. It'll be fun. I was actually going to show you like an equation that I was watching a English number file. Yeah, yeah, the British view. It's a self referential equation. Oh, Australian. I listen to Hello Internet, which is one of the hosts of that. It's a podcast. 
it's him and the guy. Uh, so Brady is the guy who does number file. Yeah, yeah. I thought, I'm pretty sure he's a, he's a Nazi. Because he always, like, for, he always talks about how he's a Nazi on, like, the other podcast. Oh, okay. Maybe he's, anyways. And, um, the, the equation, I don't think you've ever graph it, but, uh, the, the equation actually produces a graph of the equation. Uh, at, a, at a certain point, it's a big kind of equation. So that's that's funny. Yeah, I'll give you. Uh, Spend the day. <laughs> okay, something very interesting. It's it's in sort of it's in sort of the same fun type of spectrum. Oh, good, good. 